Hey there, welcome to Venti Chic. Here, we're the go-to spot for those with billionaire aspirations. In this vid, we're diving into some intriguing watch takes. We posed the question on Instagram and Facebook. What's your bold stance in the watch world? We've got about 10 to explore. If we missed any submissions, our apologies, but we'll certainly do this again if you're liking it. If you're into these videos and want more, hit that thumbs up, we totally dig it. Alright, let's break this down. Starting with Rolex, I'd say they might not necessarily top others in pure quality. Each brand excels in a specific area. Rolex shines due to their iconic designs, longevity, and market positioning. They've carved a unique niche, yet being the best in their category doesn't automatically make them the best overall. Once you dive into the watches, it's clear Rolex isn't untouchable across the board. Moving on to Omega and Breitling, yes, they tend to opt for larger cases, but their reasons are context-based. Omega, part of the Swatch Group, requires diversity due to being publicly traded. Breitling, owned by private equity, aims to enhance market share for a potential sale. Someone mentioned Zenith's Daytona-like moves. Some share this view, especially with the Chronomaster Sport. What's intriguing is Rolex used an El Primero movement in the Daytona for a decade, a peculiar rivalry. As for Zenith's lack of a dive model, my perspective is brands should stay true to their strengths and not overextend. Now let's address the next point. Has Seiko lost its way? It might not be boiling hot, but Seiko does seem off course. Prices rise, quality stagnates or dips, impacting value. Misaligned dials are also unusual. Seiko often gets a slight pass on that, which I find interesting. While minor issues might fly with entry-level Seiko 5s, venturing above a grand, it's rather unacceptable. Limited editions aren't a big deal for me either, it's when they label something limited and turn out like 8,000 pieces that things get bonkers. Let's stick to what limited really means. Seiko's rising prices relate to its unique pricing strategy. Models like SKX and SARB, popular among enthusiasts, were originally for the Japanese market, impacting pricing. Distribution issues affected Seiko too, causing markdowns due to overproduction in the past. As distribution improved, prices shifted up. Despite some increases, they aren't as extreme as expected, showing streamlined channels and better adaptation to market demands. Addressing every case should be under 40mm, some see 36-40mm to as the ideal watch size, beyond is either too big or small. Yet, preference rules. I've perhaps fueled the sub-40mm notion due to my wrist size, but forcing my preference on others? Not my vibe. After the big watch trend, there's a counter-reaction. As a fan of small cases, I get it. Still, let's not outright dismiss non-Goldilocks watches. Case in point, I appreciate bigger ones too, based on ratios, dynamics, and more. It's complex. I have a video diving into this size versus wrist topic. Interacting with others and grasping practicalities broadens perspective. Take Mitchell Schwartz, NFL's lineman and watch enthusiast. He couldn't fit a factory bracelet without links removed. That's wild, right? So stay open and grasp the market's full scope. And if you're enjoying the content so far, make sure to hit that subscribe button below and turn on the notification bell. That way, you won't miss any future videos we've got in store just for you. The realm of watch collectors is gaining traction within the broader watch market. Watches have shifted from mass market tools to collectors' items in the past decade, but remember, the market isn't solely watch enthusiasts. It's diverse. People should be open to various watch sizes that suit their wrists. On to the next topic. Danny's proposal that Grand Seiko should rethink its name. Some hesitate paying over $5,000 for a Seiko. Just as Lexus emerged from Toyota and Acura from Honda, could Grand alone suffice? It's a complex matter. Grand Seiko's been here since 1960. Renaming would entail a major change. It's likely too late now. Yet, confusion arises in distinguishing Grand Seiko from Seiko till you actually handle the products. Indeed, there's a stark contrast in finish between Grand Seiko and regular Seiko. Grand Seiko's apprehension surfaces when linked to regular Seiko, while the connection initially aided recognition, as they elevate their image, it's now a hurdle. They strive to be a luxury product and are on the path to becoming a top luxury watch brand in the US. Transitioning names now might be too complex. Overcoming this would demand education and hands-on experience. Some will always question, is it merely a Seiko? A discussion on waning watch enthusiasm emerges. Sam highlights the cyclical nature of wristwatch popularity. He notes a surge among young millennial men from 2015 to 2016, but doubts its continuation with Gen Z. He predicts a decade low of interest. 
This resonates as Swiss watch exports drop. From January to June 2019 to 2021, a 30% decline is seen. Curiously, most viewers here are under 35, a demographic usually watch engaged. Brands lag in adapting to them, ignoring those born around 2002 to 2003, shaped by iPhone since 2007. They've not seen watches as essential tools. Brands must educate, define aspiration, and prioritize longevity over short-term profits to engage this apathetic demographic. The industry needs a wake-up call. The Swiss-made label sparks controversy, suggesting a scam. Smaller firms source parts from the Far East, assemble in Swiss multi-brand facilities with minimal wages, barely adhering to regulations. Swiss-made terminology is more lax than made in the USA. In Switzerland, industrial goods need 60% manufacturing costs and key steps domestically. 60% isn't substantial. Cheaper foreign parts can create loopholes. In the USA, virtually all significant parts and processes must be domestic, while Swiss-made lacks such stringency, having notable gaps. Now, let's talk about the Octo Finissimo. Some say it's unattractive, forcing an octagon into a circle with bland dials. It's like a designer's accessory rather than a watch. But here's the twist. It's actually a rare case of true innovation. Traditional watchmaking usually gets praise, but the Oxo Finissimo dares to be different with its thickness and style. Not everyone's cup of tea, but it's refreshing to see such creativity in an industry often sticking to the same old. I find it interesting and unique, even if it's not my personal style. The watch industry often relies on past successes. Omega's Snoopy Speedmasters have caused a buzz, even with a cartoon on the dial. The Silver Snoopy Award Edition was a hit, but now prices have soared to around $40,000 in the secondary market. While the cartoon might not suit everyone's taste, the NASA connection adds value. Unusual collaborations like AP's Black Panther concept also sell out quickly. The industry is currently wild, as seen in recent auctions and Richard Mill's hype. The appeal of NASA ties and limited production drives the frenzy. The whole watch scene is quite insane. Did you find this video helpful? Drop a like if you did and don't forget to share it with your friends and family so they can benefit from it too. A noticeable trend among big brands is the lack of design creativity in new releases. They often stick to safe changes like dial colors due to financial concerns. While consumers express a desire for newness, brands fear the risk of unsuccessful launches. Yet, inventive designs like the Octo Finissimo can still face criticism. Timeless designs and heritage pieces prevail, but when brands try something different, backlash can be harsh. For instance, AP's Code 1159 faced strong criticism despite being a departure from the Royal Oak. Encouraging brands to take bolder steps and supporting innovation with actions, not just words, might drive change. The current watch design landscape is shaped by consumer expectations and market demands. People often prefer familiar designs, making it challenging for brands to balance tradition and innovation. While brands should consider this, as consumers, we should also ponder what's realistic for brands aiming to sell units. Finding new avenues in a small canvas like a watch is tough. We, as watch enthusiasts, could influence innovation by appreciating both tradition and fresh ideas. Considering how to harmonize mass market appeal and enthusiast interest might steer the industry toward more balanced creativity. So that's all of my takes on the hottest questions and statements right now in the watch industry. What opinion resonated with you the most? Let us know in the comments below. Remember to subscribe and like this video. Thanks.